for those of you who haven't worked it out yet, I'm going to retire, and I'll retire at the end of this month. And like most things which are discontinuities in your life, it makes you uh, think somewhat about uh, what's happened. Because it's like, uh, I got here by working day after day, week after week, uh, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. You know, this is 52 years we're talking about here. And you think, well, something has got to have changed in that time. Something has got to be different. And, uh, and so it was interesting just to look back. And if you bear with me, I'm going to tell you, because I think the thing that struck me is it's not just something that's been changing. Everything has been changing, and it's been changing all the time. So, I mean, this is me. This is the earliest known photograph of me in 1964. I was 15, and I... Uh, and I was just about to set off and join the MOD as an apprentice. Uh, by leaving at 15, uh, you'd notice I actually left school with no qualifications. I was an 11 plus failure. And it's always been a bit of a hang up to me because I've spent a lot of time talking with really bright guys like yourselves. And, uh, and I've always felt that somewhere in the back there, there's this undercurrent of, I'm not really qualified to talk to you. But uh, anyway, we'll come into that. I mean, this was a wonderful place to start a life because um, I was literally thrown in at the deep end. I went to this establishment and they, they essentially had what was called an instrumentation department whose job it was in life to measure what needed to be measured to keep professional electronics working and to develop solutions for, for the challenges that were coming up on an establishment which was essentially about bombs and guns. So things that went bang or things that shot projectiles, you had to measure stuff. And the professional electronics in those days didn't keep working. So this is a, an example of a, it's a HRO receiver who was renowned for quality and even today you can still pick these things up second hand market and they work remarkably well. Inside it and all you had to do to see inside it was to lift that cover because it had a bonnet. It expected you to have to service it because it, they knew it wasn't going to keep working. There were 15 valves in that and this is the sort of era then that when I moved into electronics then I was having to sort out stuff like this. With, I had a supervisor, I was an apprentice so it wasn't entirely on my own but some of the projects I did were actually uh, on my own later on in that space. But the thing about it was, this was technical excellence, but using technology that we don't use today. We have really no knowledge of valve technology or tubes, as the Americans love to call them. Interesting to note that was signal processing, because radio is signal processing, um, but it was all analog. That was no idea of going digital. There was not really a meaning to digital behind this. And of course, any kind of servicing that you needed to do involved taking the valves out and checking the valves and you needed this piece of kit which was how you tested your valves and we literally did have one of those and that had a, a CRT in that window. Um, the, it was also a very interesting time because around that time, we're still in the 65-66 era, things were changing from valves to other things and so here was a, a thing which we knew as a, as a counter timer it was a six decade counter, that's all. Um, one megahertz maximum speed, counting from microseconds through to seconds. And uh, you'd use it for timing things, or how long does it take a bullet to go from this place to another place. But in the, when I started on this, they had valves in there. And each one of these cards is a decade card, and it had four uh, flip-flops on it, and that was the circuit. And within about a year, they changed it to transistors. And you look at the circuits, they're the same. You know, they changed the voltage from 150 volts to, I think it was 24. Yeah. But, uh, but pretty well everything else about it was the same. So the cards that were in here, if you looked at the valve version, and I couldn't find a picture of the valve one, that had these little miniature valves in there. And so it's just an indication of a phase change in era. And if you look at how they added the transistors, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 11 of them there. They didn't really even have an idea about how they were going to ma uh, mount them. They just soldered onto the back of a printed circuit board. Uh, wasn't very long after, towards the end of my apprenticeship, 
that uh, the first Wakel timer uh, occurred and this one had integrated circuits in it and I can remember we were sitting around this and of course you could take the box open you can pull the cards out just the same we were looking at these things and our jaws were dropping because this six decade counter was on one printed circuit board and we were facing that degree of change and the question I remember that people were asking is how are we going to service it? No, we laugh, but in, in, in these days, you know, you change the board or you don't service it, you buy a new counter. But this was the era that we were moving from. Now, it's the same era as Gordon Moore. Because he said, uh, he wrote an article in 1965 cramming more components into integrated circuits. And uh, the actual phrase, uh, Moore's Law, was, was coined in 1970. But when Gordon made that observation, he was designing ICs, or had experience of designing ICs to the 30 or the 40 level, and he was currently designing around the 80 transistor level. Um, he predicted, you know, big deal, 1975, 65,000 transistors. But what does a 40 transistor, or a 40 device integrated circuit look like? Well, that's what it looks like. He was basing his Moore's law, or he was basing his claim, essentially on the degree of complexity of a four double input, uh, two input NAND gate uh, which is using TTL logic. And that was the circuit technique and that was the design tools that were used incidentally just for the, for the record. Um, you didn't need much more than that from a complexity point of view. There wasn't much of a verification problem, wasn't much of a test problem. You know, two inputs and output. What, what, what else are you going to do? Well of course you you took it from there, you fabricated it, and you only had one layer of metal. And uh, in this case, you know, the active devices were any underpasses that were needed. You're talk probably talking about three masks for, for doing that process. And they would churn, churn these out fairly quickly over a period of a couple of weeks, you'd have the result. Drop it into a test board, characterize it, it's what I expected, it's brilliant, it's a two input NAND gate. So 1974, just to put a, a scale on that, because Gordon Moore had said 1975 and 65,000 transistors. Well, 1974, because I opted out of the education process, that uh, somewhere between then and 1974, I went to university a bit late. Um, and so 1974, I came out from uni with my first, which is my only claim to fame, uh, and a beard. And I've still got the beard. The, me and the beard have stayed together since that, that, since that time, actually. <laughs> it used to be ginger. It used to be, I don't know, I think it was an, the idea was that it was going to attract the girls, but that didn't seem to work. <laughs> I had the same idea in the same year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, en engineers are gullible, I think. It's the, uh, it's the sociologists in there who suggest that all engineers grow beards just so that they can get all the girls. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> setting that one aside. So, but just to put a context on this, in 1974, what did electronics look like in the outside world? So, in the, in the home, in the consumer electronics, which was not a term which was going to be coined for quite a few years, actually, uh, the TV was still valves. Um, you could get five and seven transistor radios. These were the trannies, which were uh, very popular. I mean, this was high tech. And I had a seven transistor radio, whereas my mates only had a five transistor radio, and that was, that was impressive in itself. First four function calculator you could get, but you probably would have need to spend a whole week's wage to do so. They weren't cheap, but they were based on integrated circuits. Um, previously, incidentally, you could get uh, four function calculators, but they were mechanical. And I remember servicing my, because my mum used to work for an accountant, and there was a problem with their, cal with their calculator, and I serviced it. Basically, I took, took it apart and oiled it with three in one, and it was, it was okay afterwards. So the advantages of knowing something about electronics. Uh, commercially, so I went and I joined this company called TMC, which means Telephone Manufacturing Company. And, uh, and they had pretty well state-of-the-art. They had a computer. And it was in a computer room, a proper computer room, about half the size of this room. And of course it was shared by everybody. Anybody who was doing design work or anything else like that had to submit tape 
under a back, uh, into a batch box. The results of that, that uh, run, whatever it was that you were doing, uh, came out as tape. And incidentally, we were running Spice in those days, just, wow. in, just to tell you, that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. This is what the I.O. device looked like. As you typed, the tape came out here, and you could run the tape in at the back, and it would print out on paper. Some very clever people produced uh, alphanumeric co uh, combinations, so you could actually produce waveforms lengthways down a sheet, down a, a roll of paper. So we were looking up here. This is simulation moving to the f to the future. Um, the car, the telephone were very much electromechanical. Cameras, of course, mechanical and chemical. Diaries organizers, magazines, paper. No question about it, there wasn't anything else. No LCDs or LEDs. Um, the Nixie tube was a popular way of displaying numbers and the uh, ink, uh, CRT was all that you had after that. The question that interested me looking back at this point was, had I learned enough in university to prepare me for a further 42 years as a design engineer in this business. Well, I can say now, retrospectively, of course not. I mean, these subjects, on the other hand, were very familiar. And if you go to university today, you'll still see they're on the agenda. So what's going on here? I mean, they hadn't really prepared me for the outside world, and I didn't know anything about what the technology was going to do in the next 42 years. So, just to prove, prove some points, this is what a transistor radio looked like. And look at the really sophisticated looking electronic construction that's used. Um, that's the complete circuit diagram for my car, that's my car. The complete circuit diagram, not the first page or anything else like that. <laughs> there is no transistors, there is no semiconductors in that. And it, um, and it worked. Well, kind of. You had to keep polishing the points every couple of weeks. Yep. There were plenty of reasons why they stopped. The domestic phone, on the other hand, again, circa 1974, this, this is an interesting product, because look at it. I mean, it's, it's a rat's nest of wires. It's a wonderful piece of mechanical dialery. This is a, uh, a, a centrifugal speed uh, governor here. And then these little notches are the pulses, 1 to 10, and it's the speed of this dial is, is, is adjusted by this to be 10 pulses a second. Uh, so you, if you dial 1, you only get one of these interrupts, and you dial 10, you get, or 0, you get 10 of them. Now, it's pretty unsophisticated. It was designed about 1960, and it was in production from 1964 to 1984, and you can still go out and find them. They're still there, and they still work on the network. They were expected to have a 20-year lifetime, so they were expected to last till about 2004. That's a hell of a product. I mean, do we design things these days so far back, expecting them to go for so many years? Well, of course not, but it's, it's just a change that's happened. And if you look at the technologies in here, we still don't have a transistor. That's a carbon... Uh, com a carbon uh, what do they call them? Carbon microphone, just a carbon microphone. It's a capsule full of finely ground carbon with a diaphragm, and the diaphragm compresses the carbon and the resistance varies. It's pretty unsophisticated. Moving coil um, micro, uh, earpiece. <laughs> That's a neat little thing, which is just called induction coil here. It's actually a two to four wire um, uh, ballon transformer, which, which makes sure that the microphone doesn't waste too much energy by driving the earphone. Uh, and similarly, the incoming signal doesn't waste energy by trying to drive the microphone. And it's quite clever. And they also used to, for sophistication, in some of the devices, they put two positive temperature coefficient resistors on the lines, which were the AGC. Essentially, if there was too much current flowing down here, then the resistance went up and the current went down. So it was uh, a constant move towards constant current. The reason I'm so interested in this is, oh, I'll say this point. Each one of those were perfectly functional solutions to a problem. You have to think about that because there was a design engineer or more associated with each one of these. They had to choose the technologies which were available to them at the time and they had to produce a solution which was economic, was going to work and a number of other things like that criteria. So there's some aspects about being a design engineer in those days which is still very familiar to us now. But the implementations are limited by the technology available. 
so in 1976, you see, this is the next year, I was given the job, a project, of, to de of designing a module to replace the dial. And this was going to use this WISO new integrated circuit approach. Now, the project was mine, the entire project, including design of the plastic, the buttons, the, uh, the um, collapse action on the buttons, the selection of the keypad, oh, and the design of an integrated circuit. Now, I, the difficult bit I had some assistance with. That was the mechanical bit, because I didn't know the first thing about moulding plastic, but actually the rest of it just seemed like a fairly straightforward circuit problem. And, uh, and that's what happened. And we used this technique, which is called four-phase dynamic logic. Um, it was very clever, uh, but the main thing about it was it enabled you to do an awful lot with a few transistors, and the transistors could all be minimum size. And so you don't have any power supplies. Everything is driven from the clock. Uh, you just have non-overlapping clock requirements to be met. And it, so each one of these has a logic tree at the bottom of it, that's, that's the gate incidentally, that's the second gate, has a logic tree at the bottom of it, which can be as complex as you want it to be. And then because of the uh, uh, multi-phase um, nature of it, then each, each one of them is held up by half a cycle. So two, two gates together and you have a full um, uh, uh, register, essentially with little or no uh, overhead. Now it's clocked at the Sprite surprisingly speed E32 kilohertz because you didn't need it to be that fast and the technique that they used for generating those clocks was very clever uh, a guy put a little ferrite transformer together and it's something that somebody had done in the past and using the sine wave output of those you can actually generate these waveforms without, with hardly any additional components so one transistor, a little ferrite core and a capacitor and you were away with your integrated circuit now that worked it was only 150 gates though, so you wouldn't expect it to be a major challenge. It was a 350 mil die, so it's fairly big, but that really was heading towards the limit of what we could do at that time. <clears throat> but it worked and I got some accolades for doing it, I think I got a trip to the States actually, it was one of the first times I've been there. Um, now, of course, we know about Moore's Law, and I've chosen this one which is circa 1999, because it's, um, it kind of spans the top end, because 1974 is down here, 75, and today, of course, is up here and to the right. In fact, I'll draw you today up there, it's not a major issue. Um, the, the interesting thing about it is, of course, ARM is in the middle of that, just about there. And ARM was at the point where we were talking about putting a million transistors on an integrated circuit. So we already moved up quite a long way. But a million is still a long way back from where we are today, isn't it? Isn't it? Anybody know any, how many transistors we get on an integrated circuit anymore? Several billion. Yeah. Several billion, exactly. A billion being a thousand times a million? Hmm, it's worth remembering that. So, here we are today, I don't know what, 20 billion transistors for a, for a few euros. To use your currency, it used to be pounds, now it's euros because they're probably worth more. The... Uh, the, the fact remains that that's around 20,000 times more transistors on an integrated circuit and 10 times the speed than when ARM was founded. Now, I don't know about you, but if the, the comparison between a million transistors and the few that I were talking about in 1974, the EDA difference is huge. So why do we expect the EDA difference between when ARM was founded and now to be just minor. And in fact, with that degree of change, then we can see we've actually done quite a lot more. I mean, ARM was quite revolutionary in its day because they actually created a model of the CPU before they created, before it was implemented on chip. Um, we were still stuck in the uh, primeval swamp back in GEC Plessy. We didn't do that, we just created the chip and worried about uh, finding out whether it worked or not later. So ARM was quite uh, advanced in that. But I mean, this is only the start of the thin end of the wedge. It's not the end of the story. What you have to remember though, and please do, that design is fundamentally about delivering a commercial opportunity. It's not about being clever with your circuit technique or indeed the smartest soft algorithms or how speedy it is or anything like that. Its primary thing has to be functionality. It's got to be economical, it's got to be re reproducible and it's got to be innovative. 
because the innovation is the thing that improves your competitiveness against your competitor, whoever that competitor may be. It's that, if yours is just another implementation of the same thing, then all you're ever likely to get is a share of whatever the market opportunity is. So a designer delivers a promise of the future. And again, a scientist may concern themselves with the future, but an engineer delivers it. Certainty, timescales, development of manufacturing costs, quality, these are all implicitly parts of whatever you do. And certainly if it's it functional, but it's late, or it's functional, but it costs more, or it's functional, but it doesn't achieve a necessary degree of reliability. It's a design failure. And so it's got to be based on the use of appropriate and available <coughs> technologies. So those guys who designed the phone back in 1960 could have actually used valve electronics, because both technologies were available at the time, but they didn't. They chose a good functional solution, which was based on electromechanical, uh, and it's it demonstrated its success by the amount of time it stayed in the market. Uh, so it's not about using the fanciest or the newest or the optimistically promised technologies. And sometimes you have to be the judge about whether that technology is the right one to use because nobody else knows more about it than you do. Because remember that pace of growth and the pace of change, you're the one who's paid to keep up with that part of it. So you still have to effectively architect a solution which is going to achieve the commercial objectives. Uh, so it's about working with others too, and that I think is more fashionable these days to think about it. But when you started work and you were designing something on your own, and when you could design something on your own, you didn't think in terms of teams, it was just you. But now of course, and it has been for some time, we weren't able to do it all ourselves, we have to do it as part of a team. And those, as those teams have become moved first from inter internally to external teams as well. So the designer's role, nevertheless, is to create a marketable product differentiation. So it's not about using technology. That's only a way to possibly achieve it. But actually, changing the color of the case could be enough. It makes a marketable difference. It's something an engineer would do, not an electronic engineer, mechanical engineer, perhaps. And if you look at what Apple did when they, they started to go to those clear cased uh, monitors a few years ago now, but it was a, um, a revolution to think that a computer didn't have to be a functional looking object. It could, some, it could appeal to, I don't know, something inside the fuzzy mind of ordinary folk um, and such that they would dig deep into their pockets and pay the premium for using something which has got the Apple brand on it. Uh, so. Not to be um, entirely perverse then, technology, when University of Manchester produced BABY, which is generally recognized as the first stored, computer, stored program computer, um, generally recognized except there's any, if there's any Americans in the audience who have another, eye, another, an, another nominee. Um, the fact is that they didn't use valves just to be awkward. They used valves because that was the only technology that was available with the possibility of doing it. That it was going to be known enough to create that, uh, that computer. Now, you can observe from this the need for the computer, the technology of the computer, was being driven by the professionals who were associated with it, this at that time. So you can say that they were driving the technology, but the question now is, is it still the computer that's driving the technology um, today? Well, I think the answer is actually no. It's not the computer at all. The computer is benefiting from the technology, but the things that are driving the technology is all of this lot. And this is being driven by consumers, and consumers are interested in functionality, not the technology at all. So the technology comes out almost by accident, and the technology has to ripple down. So anybody who wants to use the smallest, fastest process has essentially got to use what's available commercially. You want to make a supercomputer, you use a commercial uh, computer as the basis of it. So, for example, ARM. You know, the, the computer that's in a smartphone gets, gets considered for HPC type applications. It's not the other way around. Now, people might ask why this happens, and this wave diagram, don't study it too closely. It's something I generated myself using Excel, not any numbers which should be relied upon. 
But it illustrates the point that in the beginning, back over here in the 70s, there were mainframe computers. There was a peak, because there is always a peak, people get excited about it, then it levels, and then it grows gradually. Now it still grows, it's still there, the numbers are not huge, but the things that happened in successive waves of product development, which had larger and larger markets, market values, become the dominant technologies. Those are the things that you tend to hear about. So there are still minis being sold, there are still mainframes, there are still personal computers, but the numbers are up here at the top, and the numbers are the ones that are, are driving the technology, because the product at the end of the day is delivered by um, uh, a sales force to a, to a market that needs it, and in that case the consumer is the market. I should have mentioned this point. This is the worrying part of it down here is that the the market is also moved from being professionally driven to consumer driven. Now if you go out there and you start to talk to a whole bunch of professionals they'll tell you this is what we need but you've actually got to start saying well you can't have it not like that because this is this is where the drive is coming from. Now the second line on here I really didn't touch on but again it's one of the things that ITRS included and it was productivity and things happened around the time of ARM and one of the things that of course made ARM successful was that it was a CPU that other people could embed into their integrated circuits. Before that time people weren't interested in it. After that time it becomes so bloody obvious, excuse my French, that you needed to partition the, the, the design task and help uh, and give it to give some parts of it to other people that it became the turning point for ARM. Um, now if you look at the scale of these things, around the time that ARM was um, being born, an integrated circuit of a million transistors was being designed essentially clean sheet on a large sheet of paper, um, and it was taking about 100 person years to do it. They were manageable numbers. But of course, if you look to the future, those numbers were going to get out of hand very quickly. Now, ITRS stopped reporting this, and part of the reason they stopped reporting it was it was going away. So we don't have that problem today. It's big numbers, but it's not that problem. And of course that problem was going to get worse because verification became an issue, which also was going to increase the, the, the productivity gap. So another thing then that's happened over that period of time is the design itself has moved from single designer, small team, local teams, to global teams. And to make that happen, reuse in different phases, different levels, have come in increasingly to support the design activity to make sure that people are getting, getting out what they want to get out. And w without greater than 90% reuse today, electronic systems would be unproducible. Now if you ask most people how much reuse do we do today, they tend to say not all that much. But they're ignoring all the research re uh, reuse that we actually do. So again, it's one of those things, look at the thing that we're actually doing. You take a phone, hold it up to the light, you know, there's, there's integrated circuit technology in there, yes, but there's software methods and methodology, but there's also displays and there is also keyboards and other things which are reuse because we're working for delivering functionality, not for delivering technology. Again, a little story I like to tell, 1998, a little bit further along, this is what a state-of-the-art um, prosumer camera looked like. So it's a Canon mid-range, good quality camera. Excellent lenses, doing a, an analog translation instantly of 3D to 2D. I think that that's a pretty damn clever thing to be doing and most people are still using lenses to do it today. And they were using two-dimensional photochemical memory, which is the, the way of, of course, converting the 2D transposition into a permanent media. Um, no electronics to speak of, electromechanical exposure meter, uh, the metal and the plastic forming, plastic was a bit basic, metal work is rather simple, assembly was by hand. Today, 2016, Canon EOS 5D, same market, excellent lenses, arguably probably better, still doing the same trans transformation. Precision forming of plastics and metal looking much better, but now of course we have a computer in there, which we would recognize, but there is also other things, analog electronics, sensors and transducers, 
Um, there's no doubt about it being electronics, but as a result you have batteries and energy storage displays and LEDs. We also have robotic assembly. I mean, it is not actually possible to assemble a camera like this by hand. The micro motors, the precision uh, uh, piezo motors which they use for focusing and, and such like, literally are too small to be assembled by hand, uh, but that's not all. So when they do repair on them, increasingly they throw them away, but then they're, they're so reliable it doesn't really matter. But what's happened here is that the things beyond the product have also become part of the design space. So as a designer, you don't now only have to design a camera, but you also have to design a way of making it. So electronic systems is increasingly about the viable, timely, economic integration of multiple technologies and has already moved on from hardware and software co-design, which is so yesteryear, so last century. We certainly shouldn't be fighting about it anymore. What we still need, however, is a revolution, because this is um, the average smartphone. You can work out whose it is. Um, it's got all of these things in it. A lot of them are fairly sophisticated, but you know, education and training is in there. You can't, you've got to know how to use these things. You've got to find information. There's uh, micro-machines again. The little vibrator motor is incredibly tiny. Um, physical components, though, are the build list of this. If it, they work on the, on, on the model that you're, if you buy all these components and you stick them onto a printed circuit <coughs> board, then you have a phone. And of course, you know there's a lot of other stuff that goes into that phone to make it work. Like the ROM needs some content and it's got to come from somewhere. And there may be several chips in there which need to be configured uh, and also systems which need to be configured. The bill of material doesn't go there. This is a war, war that I've been fighting for a few years and I will fight, it will fight for a few more. And if you want to join in, great. Virtual components are the biggest value of a product like this these days and yet they don't appear on the bill of materials. And as long as they don't on the peer, appear on the bill of materials, they're out of sight. And out of sight means out of mind. And out of mind means forgotten. It's where arm is. We don't want to be forgotten. We want to be remembered. We want to be noticed. So last couple of slides. How am I doing for time, Bruno? I think you're good. Good. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. I mean, uh, essentially, I'm looking at, you know, what, what are we trying to do here? Essentially, as the years have gone by, we've been given, because of Moore's Law, a wonderful capacity. Now, that capacity has traditionally gone up by a factor of two every 18 to 24 months. And it's given us a problem because that 20,000 times more functionality had to be utilized somehow. So somewhere we had to uh, find a way of using all those transistors without wiring them up individually, without connecting them all, and without having to check and test them all individually for every specific application. And so we've used, we've introduced into, into our language, into our um, quiver, methods to support the regular, uh, the use and reuse of ra large regular hardware blocks. Now that helps tremendously with using up the transistors in a circuit. I'm going to use it in that context. It's using them up. We've got to find a way of using these things. Memory is good. Let's fill a chip with it. You know, processors are good. Let's fill a chip with them. And then we can, we can leave the rest of the hardware design to be a few tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of gates just poured in around the edge if we want to do so. But that's not a product. Product. That's only the platform on which a product can be created. So you also need to have high productivity system design. So abstraction hierarchy and that takes you into software. Now software is a way of using transistors. It's a way of exploiting the potential of a chip. It's not a different world. It's just another way of, of manipulating those, those gates, those logics which are provided. Now, you can tend to think then that the only important part of this exercise is the silicon. Well, actually, no. The most important part of any product is the bit that you haven't got. So if, you, if you've got a smartphone and you haven't got a display or it hasn't got touch input and everybody else's does, then you've got a crap product, no matter how good the software or the, or the silicon is or whatever geometry processes you're using. So the thing that matters is making that whole thing work still. Silicon is a problem, yeah. Software is a problem too. 
And hardware is a problem in the displays and in the RF and the integration and the noise control and all of those things which are necessary to make real products. They're all a problem. They're all difficult. So we mustn't get the, the idea that silicon is the centre of this universe. It's the third or fourth planet. It's still a good place to be, but the universe is about the product, not about that. So it's only the system mentality is an important thing that's come up. We're, we're, we're part way there. We're not there. Methods for using other people's expertise. Again, we're part way there. It's the extension of the reuse model. We started to acquire companies that have areas of expertise that we don't have. We're not alone doing this because people who are trying to deliver product realize that they need to have that expertise and the only way to get it is to deploy people who basically know something about it. So Moore's law is still there and it may be struggling but I would say it's, it's not really struggling for the right reason. He never claimed it was about transistors. We interpreted it as about transistors. All we're actually talking about is doubling functional density. A genuine way of doubling functional density is to put two dye on top of one another in a package. I mean, it's not, it's not um, linear scaling anymore. It's not planar scaling anymore. But it is a genuine doubling of functional density. Now, if you look at the, the um, advances that have been made in packaging technology recently, then you realize you know, a smartphone is a pretty damn thin thing. And it's being put together under production environment. And yes, they can charge a large amount of money for it. But nevertheless, people are prepared to pay because they like the, uh, uh, the product and the functionality that it gives them. So I predict that functional density will continue. So in functional density in the box will continue to double every 18 months for the indefinite future. It will still be Moore's law. It's just Moore's law, not as we knew it before. So my finishing line then, 2016, I got here. 52 years of change every flipping day. Uh, 52 years of people expecting me to know what to do all the time, even when I've only just picked up a book and read something about it just now. All of a sudden, I am the expert. Not because I am an expert, but because I know a little bit more about it than the next person. It's been a wonderful experience. It's been tough. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And right now, I don't want to retire. But it has done some recalibration for me. And one thing that it uh, probably did, I told you I had a bit of a hang up about leaving school without qualifications. And one thing that, that registered with me, and it's because it's, other people have said similar things. You know, I've, I've got a, uh, uh, a degree, I've got a doctorate, I've got a master's, whatever. I don't get any extra money for having that. And I think the, the thing that, that, that's puzzling about that is why? Surely this is a, a good thing to have. And of course the answer is, yes, it is a good thing to have. But it's only the start. This learning exercise that you're going to do throughout your life is not solely an extension of what you learned in university. It's the extension of that on, built up on a day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, in case I've not mentioned that before. It's a continuous process of learning. And what it did, what the formal education did, was it got me into the room. Whatever the room was, a meeting or an environment in which there were some people who knew a lot more about stuff than I did, but at least I, I could understand the fraction of what they were saying. Maybe even I could contribute a little bit about some of the thoughts which are going on in a university context at that point. If I contribute a little bit, and if I learn a little bit, then my knowledge is going in the right direction. And if I've contributed, they're likely to ask me to come back next time. And so the measure of success after a few years is still being in the room, not how you got there anymore. And that's a little bit of a disconcerting thing, because I shouldn't be in, the, in many rooms, and yet I have been in many rooms. And I've been in many rooms, I guess, because I've contributed, which essentially means when you go to a meeting, don't sit there like a dodo. You may be stupid, but you're actually a hell of a lot brighter than a lot of people. And, uh, and you may have something genuine to say. And the wonderful thing about this environment is if you say something stupid, people don't laugh at you. They explain to you why it's, why it's stupid. <laughs> 
they explain to you why you've got the wrong end of the stick. But nevertheless, it's a learning exercise. Now, the other thing is it recalibrated what being a design engineer was too, in terms of the responsibilities. Because I clearly, I'm expected to know something about my domain discipline. That's, you know, that's a speciality to me. I should be interested in how that's evolving and I should be reading about that. But the other thing is, I've become aware that you have got, your technology is only ever going to be a part of an end product. And your end product is the thing which is going to fuel this whole development cycle, including your job and including the researchers in universities, programs and other things like that. Because success is, is its own reward. It gets that money flowing. And we need to have that money flowing, which means that we have got to have a wider perspective than engineers have traditionally tended to do. So continuous change, continuous challenge, lots of learning throughout my working life. But there is no wonder then that I always felt in some way inferior, like I was cheating, like I was pretending to know more about the stuff than I did. It's hardly surprising. We're all, su we're all surrounded by this, and I've heard other engineers say the same thing instantly. We're all so, so surrounded by change, we know what we don't know. And we tend to focus on that. What we've actually got to say is, you're doing your best. We're hanging on in there. We're trying as a team to create a solution, to try and make some sort of order out of chaos. That's why we're here. That's what engineers do. That's why you're not, your job is not, um, your seat is not occupied by a technician. Technicians do what somebody else has told them how to do. Engineers solve problems, problems which are sometimes difficult to even quantify. So being a design engineer today then, will the next 50 years be less difficult than the last? Well, I think you can see there's been a hell of a lot of change gone on in my 50 years. I don't think there is any sign whatsoever of it slowing down. It's the same environment that you're going to take. 50 years from now, 40 years from now, choose your number. You will retire, you'll stand up and you'll explain to people what you were doing when you joined, you know, and they will have a laugh. You know, good God, they were actually working with integrated circuits. Who knows? <laughs> so primarily, don't be afraid to admit you don't know. We're all so bound by our inferiority complexes, being these social inept engineers that we are. We don't want to admit to anybody outside that we don't know what, we do, what we're doing, or we certainly feel really hesitant about it. But don't be admit, because we're all in this together. We're trying to find a solution. If you've got something to give, give it. Go to meetings to contribute what you know. To overcome the team challenge. It's not your problem entirely, it's the team. We're trying to get the product out all the time. Um, remember that successful end products pay for everything. There is nobody who lives in a bubble. Nobody. Nobody has any kind of protected space. Well, perhaps me. I don't know, I've lived in a bubble for too long. Uh, don't lose sight of it. See, uh, see the change happening around you. We're not good at seeing the change. We're good at seeing the problem in front of us. We've got to see the wider picture. It's only when you see the wider picture that you'll appreciate what you're doing in the context to it. So do move out from your shell a little bit. It still doesn't have to move out into full social uh, contacts, but it's down, uh, it is sort of mixing with other engineering types. And embrace the uncertainty of the challenge and the change, because it's your job to handle it. Which only says one final thing from my point of view. Thank you all, thank you all seriously for making my career so full of wonder. It's been a wonderful time and thank you. <laughs>